Hi, welcome back to another video. Today I'm diving into a lesser known but fascinating aspect of the Beatles' legacy. While Paul McCartney and John Lennon are best known for writing some of the greatest hits in musical history, they also wrote numerous songs for other artists. So in this video I'll explore why they did this, list some of the songs, perhaps in chronological order, of their release and share some stories behind each one. And hopefully I'll be shining a light on the creativity and generosity of Lennon and McCartney as songwriters. In the early years of the 1960s, Paul McCartney and John Lennon were writing songs at an incredible pace. They didn't just create music for the Beatles, they also penned tracks for other artists, helping friends and fellow musicians in a flourishing Mersey beat scene. Now at the time, the Beatles weren't sure how long their own success would last, so writing for others was a way to diversify their careers. And it also allowed them to experiment with different styles and showcase their versatility as songwriters. In 1963, Lennon and McCartney wrote I'll Keep You Satisfied for Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. Billy J. Kramer was managed by Brian Epstein, which is likely why Lennon and McCartney were willing to share their songs with him. The song became a hit, reaching number four in the UK singles chart. Interestingly, McCartney later noted that while the song was crafted with Billy J. Kramer in mind, it was still a typical Beatles number, reflecting their early sound. Later that year, Bad To Me was written by John and also given to Billy J. Kramer. The song became a number one hit in the UK, and it's said that Lennon wrote this while on holiday in Spain. The Beatles themselves never recorded it, but it stands as one of the best examples of how Lennon could write catchy commercial songs, even when he wasn't performing them. I'm in Love was another Lennon composition, released in late 1963 by The Foremost. This track didn't achieve the same level of success as some of the others, but it was another gift from Lennon to a fellow Liverpudlian band, The Foremost, who were also managed by Brian Epstein, making them a natural recipient for Lennon and McCartney songs. The Foremost also recorded Hello Little Girl, which has the distinction of being one of the first songs John Lennon ever wrote back in 1957. The Beatles performed it during their Decca audition in 1962, but it was the foremost who recorded and released it as their debut single in 1963. The song reached number nine on the UK single chart, showing how even Lennon's early compositions had commercial potential. Another song from 1963 is Tip of My Tongue, written by Paul McCartney and given to Tom Quickly. Another artist managed by Brian Epstein. Now McCartney wrote this with the intention of it being a hit, but it didn't perform as well as expected. This song shows that even the best songwriters in the world, not every tune was destined for the top of the charts. Love of the Loved, written by McCartney, was performed by the Beatles during their Decca auditions, but wasn't recorded by the band. Instead, it was given to Cilla Black. Released as her debut single in 1963, the song only reached number 35 in the UK charts. However, it established Scylla as a rising star, leading to a very successful career. In 1964, Peter and Gordon, a duo featuring Peter Asher, the brother of Paul McCartney's then-girlfriend Jane Asher, recorded A World Without Love. I won't stay in a world without love. 
Written by Paul McCartney, the story goes that Peter Asher once asked McCartney how he wrote songs, and in response, McCartney quickly wrote A World Without Love to demonstrate his process. The song became a massive hit, reaching number one in both the UK and the US. Despite its success, the Beatles never recorded it themselves, making it one of the most famous given away songs in pop history. The Applejacks released Like Dreamers Do in 1964, a song that Paul McCartney had written in the late 50s. The Beatles included it in their Decca audition, but after being rejected, they didn't pursue the song further. The Applejacks version brought the song to a wider audience, although it didn't achieve major success. The track is a glimpse into McCartney's early songwriting style with a catchy melody and simple romantic lyrics. It's funny how these songs all have that similar Beatles vibe, but why wouldn't they, right? Peter and Gordon then had another hit with Nobody I Know, again written by McCartney and released in 1964. Everyone I know is sure it shines for you. By this time, McCartney and Lennon were using their songwriting skills to help friends and allies in the music industry. Nobody I Know became a top 10 hit in the UK, further cementing Peter and Gordon's place in the pop scene. Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas struck gold again with From a Window, a Lennon-McCartney tune released in 1964. The song was their last top 10 hit and marked the end of their most successful period. The track was written in McCartney's home and although it wasn't a Beatles song, it carried the unmistakable sound that made them famous. One and One is Two was another McCartney composition. In 1964, it was given to The Strangers with Mike Shannon. And despite the song's potential, it didn't become a hit, showing that even McCartney's magic touch didn't guarantee success for every artist. Peter and Gordon factor again. I Don't Want to See You Again, which was another McCartney composition, was recorded by Peter and Gordon in 1964. Someone says to me, I don't want to see you again. The song's melancholy tone and introspective lyrics were different from the duo's earlier hits, which might explain its more modest chart performance. Nonetheless, it's another example of McCartney's willingness to share his work with friends. In 1965, That Means A Lot was written during the help sessions, but didn't make the final cut for the Beatles. The song was then given to PJ Proby, the American singer popular in the UK. Now it was produced by George Martin and the track was heavily orchestrated, but it didn't achieve major commercial success. Despite this, it remains an interesting footnote in the Beatles story, showing that the tracks that didn't quite fit with their evolving sound could work with other artists. The heavy orchestration in the song reminds me of the Let It Be Heavy Sound by Phil Spector. And it's interesting that whilst being produced by George Martin, I'm reminded of his comments about the Let It Be release when he stated... And then the final snub was that um, EMI said, well, we wouldn't have your name, my name, on the album, because Phil Spector had now produced it. And I said, well, look, why don't you, let's have a compromise. Why don't you say, produced by George Martin, overproduced by Phil Spector? was this PJ Proby song overproduced. <laughs> also, also, while I'm on the roll here, doesn't PJ Proby look like Ron Nasty? No? <laughs> Maybe it's just me then. Zilla Black received It's For You, written by McCartney and released in 1964. I couldn't possibly do a show without the wonderful and talented thingy. <laughs> It's for you, love, true love. 
The song's sophisticated melody and jazzy chords made it stand out from the usual pop fair and it became a top 10 hit in the UK and demonstrated McCartney's ability to write in a variety of styles. The track was another collaboration with George Martin, who was heavily involved in shaping its unique sound. In 1966, Paul McCartney wrote Woman for Peter and Gordon, but used the pseudonym Bernard Webb. Woman, do you love me? Woman. McCartney wanted to see if the song could succeed without the famous Lennon-McCartney name attached. To everyone's surprise, it did quite well, reaching number 14 on the UK singles chart and proving that the song's success wasn't just about the famous name behind it. Step Inside Love, written by McCartney, was a song intended for Cilla Black's television show. Released in 1968, it was a hit and became one of Cilla Black's signature songs. McCartney wrote it specifically with Black in mind, tailoring it to her voice and style. The song's catchy melody and warm, inviting lyrics made it a perfect fit for her. The last song I'm going to talk about is actually perhaps one of my favourites of the giveaway songs. And that is a song, Goodbye, written by McCartney and recorded by Mary Hopkin in 1969. McCartney also played guitar on the track and produced it. Mary Hopkin was one of the first artists signed to Apple Records and Goodbye was a follow-up to her smash hit, Those Were The Days. The song was a commercial success, reaching number two in the UK. Interestingly, McCartney later revealed that the song was initially intended to be a Beatles track but they never got around to recording it. And it's strange because the way it's produced and the way Mary Hopkins sings it, I could actually imagine it being a whimsical McCartney tune, perhaps one of the Segway songs on the Abbey Road medley, who knows. These songs then are more than just footnotes in the careers of Lennon and McCartney. They represent a fascinating chapter in their musical journey. By writing for others, they not only helped shape the careers of fellow artists, but also expanded their own influence across the music industry. Even though the Beatles themselves were probably the biggest band in the world, maybe they still are, their generosity in sharing their songwriting talents showed a commitment to the broader music scene. In doing so, they left an indelible mark on pop culture that extends far beyond their own recordings. I was almost going to say like, share, subscribe, but I'm going to get out of that mentality because I don't think it serves as a good purpose. I know that when I'm watching YouTube videos, I almost want to say, I'll oh, go away, stop telling me to do this. But then I'm an avid YouTube viewer. So um, anyway, that's, that's it for this video. Hopefully you'll see me again soon in another Beatles video. I'm sure I've got some planned. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.